At no point does it mention what the schools do, why they exist, why parents send their children there. There's this very narrow focus on what they fail to do. But at the same time, the Hasidi community can make a very convincing argument for anyone who wants to listen, that democratic man is depriving the child of the elective responsibility and therefore the satisfaction that comes with family loyalty, with community loyalty, with being deeply rooted, with having a sense of a strong identity and purpose. I don't think it's reasonable to accept that the community needs to do more to undermine its own approach to raising children in their own way of life so that in the in the case that they fail that the child succeeds in an alternative way of life i've never believed in whitewashing those stories that have been shared publicly i you know it pains me to see how those stories dominate the portrayal of the hasidic world so you've got the hasidic movement that have set up camp precisely within it right in Brooklyn, New York, in, in London, you know, 10 minutes from the city, from the city center and thriving in this way. And in fact, by doing that, they were able to take advantage of certain tools and, and certain infrastructure, which has only helped them grow and thrive. I think, I think it's fascinating. We're at the beginning of some very interesting times. I don't think we can make predictions. I think things are changing fast and, you know, I would get the popcorn and watch. Hello. Today, for my long-form interview series, I bring you a talk with Ellie Spitzer, who is a principal at a Hasidic boys' yeshiva and who writes a column for Mosaic magazine on various interesting topics of Hasidic and Jewish life, but most noteworthy on the subject of the Hasidic boys' education controversy. And so, most of our talk centered on this issue, and I thought it would be helpful before we dive in, that I set it up by summarizing what the controversy is all about. The city communities around the world educate their children in gender-segregated institutions that are very different for boys and girls, preparing the boys and girls for their respective and different roles in the society. And so, what boys learn and girls learn is very different. In places like Williamsburg, for instance, the children all speak Yiddish as the first language, but the girls will go to school starting from grade one, receiving a half a day of Judaic instruction in Yiddish and a half a day of English language instruction on math, science, history, and other secular subjects. On the other hand, the boys have a much more old-fashioned traditional education aimed at teaching them the Torah and the Talmud and socializing them in their male roles. And so, while they speak Yiddish as a first language, they have to master Biblical Hebrew, Aramaic for the holy texts, and they will receive much less secular education, if anything of substance, which will end at age 13 bar mitzvah. I myself, for instance, am a graduate of one of the most insular sects. I graduated from the Satmar Hasidic Kiryas Joel Baisrochel School, and still I received a half a day of English education from grade one until 11, and by the time I graduated, I was fairly comfortable communicating in English as a second language, and I think this is generally the case across the board for Hasidic women. On the other hand, the degree to which Hasidic men will master English varies greatly and there are definitely very great degrees of English in proficiency among children from these education institutions and the basic rudimentary subjects of math, science, history and so on are often not covered for boys at all and so in recent years this has caused an enormous outcry and pressure from the outside as well as from activists who left the community to force change in Hasidic boys' yeshivas. The subject, the debate around this is often very contentious and often very simplistic and Spitzer's take is, I think, very fresh and very multifaceted and I present it to you today for hopefully some very thought-provoking perspectives. So it seems you've scheduled something for uh, 9.30, huh? Uh, no, don't worry about that. It's okay. Fine. All right. I, I was wondering what the time crunch is. It's not before 9.30. It's not before 9.30. Chasid time. 
I'll see you this time. Okay. It's, very it's, very it's, it's fine. We have, we have an understanding. Okay. All right. Very good. First of all, welcome. Um, and second of all, let's start by summarizing to the viewers what the issue is with Hasidic boys' education. Um, if I have to summarize it, I think at the moment, and I, I'm going to try and focus on um, the American story, if you like, specifically the state of New York, although I should say right from the get-go that there are very similar um, debates and arguments and controversies playing out wherever Hasidic Jews are concentrated, uh, specifically outside of Israel. In Israel, there's a separate um, ongoing political conversation going on, but I think we should leave that aside. But right, and, and Canada, maybe uh, let's, for the record, you're in the UK. Yeah. You're in London? I am in London. Um, I was born and raised in the Hasidic community of Stamford Hill in London, which is the largest Hasidic community in Europe. And I... I have also, especially in my capacity as a columnist for Mosaic magazine, I've spent a lot of time reading up on the issue of education, the Hasidic boys' education in New York. Um, although for anyone who's familiar with the Hasidic community, the Hasidic community is a very uh, transnational community. I have uncles, first cousins who are in Williamsburg and Borough Park and Monsey, Usually, a city will feel sort of an affinity with Hasidic communities, you know, across the Atlantic more so perhaps than they would seem even with other Orthodox Jewish communities twenty minutes away. So uh, I, I, they, wouldn't I, do, I, they wouldn't do shidduchim. They wouldn't do matches with communities twenty minutes away that are not. Yeah, well, uh, there are exceptions, but as a general rule, they are more likely to um, match their children with a shidduch from a more similar Hasidic sect, either the same sect or a sort of a, a close ally of the same sect, even if it's in Israel or in New York, rather than um, a non-Hasidic, um, yeshivish, litvish, orthodox Jewish family, even on the same street. So I think there might be some sort of generalizations, and there are certainly certain differences about the whole education controversy for Hasidic boys, but there's also certain um, key features which are um, which feature in all of the Hasidic communities. And I think I always start with acknowledging, just because it saves a lot of time, with acknowledging that the, the typical Hasidic Jewish secular education is way below the standards of what you would expect in a mainstream state education system. Um, the simple, uh, the basic facts of the matter is that a tiny proportion of the day in a, Hasidic, a typical Hasidic boys' school is dedicated to secular studies, to the core subjects of English, math, science, history, and so on. I would say usually between one hour and two hours a day, it starts pretty late, so it would start, so it doesn't start so sort of from uh, the beginning of sort of nursery, it starts usually two or three years into sort of the age of maybe six or seven, and it comes to an end at sort of the age of bar mitzvah, around the age of 13. So simply from the amount of time dedicated to secular studies, it comes nowhere near to competing with the amount of time that mainstream schools dedicate to what for them is just the default curriculum of the school, the full range of secular subjects. Now, the standard and the level, the quantity of that little bit of secular education that does exist at Hasidic school varies. There is a lot of, um, well, it does vary. There are certain communities and certain individual schools where it is extremely poor. It is almost treated as a joke. And there are other schools who are making a very decent effort to actually use that time effectively and give provide these children with some basic skills in English and in maths and so on. But my biggest problem is that whenever we talk about this education issue, the whole debate and argument is dominated by two, what I believe are two fundamentally disingenuous or at, at the very least flawed um, arguments. You have on the one side, the advocates for secular education, who deliberately or not, tend to ignore what the function of Hasidic schools are. They zoom in on this element of secular education, call it educational neglect, fail to acknowledge that these schools are doing anything other 
and failing to provide a good standard of secular education. And they give the impression to people from the outside who have no first-hand familiarity with these schools that all these schools are doing are sort of chanting or praying at some sort of extreme third world sort of version of strange cultish sort of behavior where the children and families are sort of trapped in this weird dystopian system and they just fail to meet any basic standards of education and on the other hand the defense of classic yeshivas is dominated by people who claim that they provide an excellent standard of secondary education now this claim varies from the one hand just claiming that oh we just provide an excellent um, standard of English and maths and the sort of the most sophisticated curricula and children leave at the end being sort of highly sophisticated thinkers, writers, artists, and so on. Um, to the other end of the spectrum, which claim, yes, we may not spend as much time on secular education, but the amount of time we spend on biblical and Talmudic texts provides some sort of interesting mental facility where children Man, it can bypass the need to sit through the typical English and maths curriculum because somehow they attain these sort of almost supernatural skills of being able to be the best at English, math, science, history, or whatever discipline they choose to pursue by virtue of studying Talmud. Talmud. But as of them are wrong, and again, this is not about accusing anyone, any individual organization or person, whether it's deliberate or not, whether it's just misguided, I don't really care. But what does bother me is because as someone who does care deeply about this is that you can't actually have an effective conversation about this if you don't start by understanding what is going on. And, and I really, I, you know, I, I get into lots of arguments and I, I usually end up passionately defending the facility community, but it is always, I, I, I really, really resent the having to defend the facility community from a position of pulling the wool over the eyes and hoping that the other side won't actually find out the reality. I think the first thing is to establish the facts on the ground, the facts that anyone who walks into one of these schools will see, and that is a standard of secular education that when compared with a decent, let's not talk about sort of some inner city deprived ethnic minority school, which are sort of underperforming, which is often used as, oh, have a look at this Hispanic or black school and they're much worse. Let's just talk about a typical suburban upper middle class school. You compare the, the, the attainment of children and literacy and numeracy, and you see that what the mainstream schools provide is far superior to the standard of secular education that Pacific boys yeshivas provide. That is something which has to be acknowledged. When there was this big massive outcry about the New York Times front page back in September uh, on... 9-11, um, it was actually the front page story of Hasidic schools, the failing of Hasidic yeshivas. I read the entire report, both the English and the Yiddish version of it, and I had my issues with the way they concentrated on the money side of it. I think there were some insinuations there, which perhaps were slanted to try and portray something, I don't know. But when it came to describing the standard of secular education, I recognized it. And I think, yep. That pretty much is a reflection of what the majority, typical Hasidic boys yeshivas look like. And yet, which, and is what, which is what? Just just summarize. What what does that mean? They don't speak any English. Well, yes, they're not, they're not really fluent um, in English in the way you would expect a child growing up in the United States would be, even if they sort of have a different first language at home. It wasn't so much focused on the specific attainment levels in English or maths, but I think there was sort of a general feeling that they don't participate in some sort of like national civic conversation. They don't recognize their cycle, their sort of, even their calendar perhaps doesn't evolve around the sort of key highlights of a typical academic calendar in a mainstream school. The... The quality of education, the quality of instruction, so the quality of teaching is again not something that doesn't meet basic standards of what a professional, trained, qualified teacher would deliver in a typical classroom. There doesn't seem to be any commitment to adopting 
both on an academic level and a pedagogical level, the norms that have been established in typical schools across the country. Right. And that, I think, was is the accusation. Again, as I said before, at no point does it mention what the schools do, why they exist, why parents send their children there. There's this very narrow focus on what they fail to do, which is for someone who either doesn't want to or doesn't know how to start understanding why these schools exist, it is very easy to just start imagining a complete, uh, horrific sort of story of what is, I guess, tantamount to the child abuse, the child neglect, failing to meet the basic needs of a child. And that is the accusation that the Facility community stands accused of. Now, the extension of that is that, therefore, these children are doomed to a life of poverty, to a life of welfare dependence, to the inability to compete in the 21st century economy, and then, perhaps for some people, most importantly, the inability to make a choice later in life of whether they want to continue being members of this community or not. Right. So I think those are sort of the accusations leveled at the Hasidic yeshiva system. Uh, well, first and foremost, obviously, is the core accusation that it is child abuse in itself to deprive children of the language of the land and, and of the standards, which are the accepted um, norms. And then on top of that, we have the conversation about it deprives um, the children of career opportunities and um, they become dependent on the state and so on. I, I just want to, I guess I want to hear... What do you, where do you stand on the very idea that children don't get secular education? What's your response to that? Uh, I, to be honest, Frida, over the years, I have mellowed up a bit on this. When I first started in, in well, I, to, to, I started as an educator. I was actually teaching um, Kodesh. I was teaching religious studies. That's how I started. You were Malamud? Yeah, I was Malamud. I was a, a class river and... The reason that the way I got involved in secular education was just because I've sort of established a reputation for being a disciplinarian and for being able to sort of manage behavior well. And I was approached by another school that simply needed help with this whole department, their secular studies department. And mainly what they wanted was just someone who can sort of introduce a decent behavior policy and implement it properly because they were having trouble. And that was really the way I got involved. But very early on, I worked up the sort of passion that this is, you know, this is a disaster. We need to, every child deserves the right to have a, a decent standard of secular education. I was never obsessed with sort of a national standard per se. I, I, for me, it was never about what the authority said that a typical, well-rounded national standard of education should look like. I, for me, it was always about literacy first and foremost. I, I had sort of my own baggage, if you like, my own chip on my shoulder as someone who sort of had to teach myself English and it was quite a sort of sustained effort, you know, to have to teach myself to read and, and struggle to speak English initially and kind of sort of... I read that you taught yourself English when you were 16. Is that right? I taught myself English when I was 16, but let's not get too excited about that. I, I grew up in England and I had enough exposure to the English language. I just wasn't comfortable speaking English up until the age of 15, 16, and I had to sort of make a concerted effort to read and be disciplined about it. And, and you know, I remember one of the first books I read was the Harry Potter uh, yeah. book, the first one, which I read in Yeshiva and I wasn't really supposed to, but that was sort of exciting enough to motivate me to struggle through the vocabulary that I didn't quite understand and to have to sort of look it up and, you know, so I, I sympathized with that and I felt, you know, I am perhaps more precocious and more motivated than other children would be. And I had friends who sort of every now and again would moan about the fact that, you know, if only they could speak English fluently. And, and I started picking up on this sort of trend of the Hasidic members in the Hasidic community, people sort of my age who sort of felt like they are sort of um, observers, spectators to world affairs, to current affairs, but not really participants. High quality literature, obviously, and I spent many years selecting high quality, but also appropriate, culturally appropriate books and texts and so on. And that still motivates me today. I guess the biggest exception today is that I no longer 
see it as even an aspiration to impose it universally across the Hasidic community. I now see it as a much more sort of narrower task of creating an option for Hasidic parents who want something different and helping them being able to give their children a good standard of secular education without having to choose between a, a Hasidic education or a good standard of secular education and giving them the ability to do both. I don't even think, I think it would be too arrogant for anyone to decide that because you have had some sort of epiphany and decided what the ideal form of existence as a Hasidic Jew should be, and therefore you should now impose that across an entire community. But I have certainly identified a growing number of Hasidic parents who want a decent standard of secular education, but they're not prepared to pursue it at the cost of compromising the children's Hasidic upbringing. And I think having an option that allows for some sort of reconcilement, a reconciliation between the two as much as possible is a noble ambition. And this is something that I'm involved with at the moment. I, okay, I want to talk about making it optional, which is ex essentially what I'm hearing you say. Uh, you, you've you gone from being maybe a little more dogmatic, more idealistic, that everyone should have the dignity of a secular education to it, there should be parents should have the choice, which right now they often don't have because they want other benefits that has a Hasidic cheder school provides. And as a part of that package deal, they don't get secular education. And I, I want to lead this conversation in a way that people lead it for me. You know, personally, I'm interested in a lot of parts of this conversation, but people, uh, I give walking tours and my tours, people will say all the time, regardless of what the parents think, it is abuse or, or it is wrong for children not to speak the language of the land or for children um, not to have these basic educations um, and, and, you know, what I find with what you were saying about the dignity of being able to communicate in English, I have found since we didn't talk about this, as a woman, I got a very different education. I haven't personally experienced uh, what it means to not be able to communicate in English. I have found that there were so, so, so many men in the community and to some degree who left who are so favaitukt, which is Yiddish for hurt, they are so hurting over the education. The, the, the number one thing I hear from people is pain over feeling robbed of education. And people will often say it in for, it, when they talk about it, they talk about it as if it's about careers, but I don't think it's about careers. I do think you're onto something and saying it's about dignity of being not like a savage, yeah, feeling like a mensch in society. So that, that I think is a very, very fair, uh, complaint. Like should parents have the right to subject their children to the indignity of not being able to be a mensch in society to the degree that you feel that way when you don't speak proper or we hardly speak English. Uh, I, before I answer that question, I, I, I do want to say that I, I, I know what you mean with the amount of people who leave or who are considering leaving the community who have this incredible resentment specifically to the poor standard of secular education that they yes. receive. But I also think that they overestimate the extent to which simply being fluent in English would have helped them. And I think that they think that just being fluent in English would be the answer to all of their problems when it comes to assimilating into the wider world. And I think it's a lot more complicated than that. And I think it, the, the invisible cultural norms, social norms, which are so deeply ingrained, is probably just as difficult to navigate when you leave the Hasidic community. And you will know more about this than I do because you have left and I haven't. But I think if you only look at non-Hasidic, Litvish, Yeshivish communities who do speak English, that seems to be a similar sort of um, resentment towards the shelter, the narrow upbringing that they receive. So I think we should be cautious and not pretend that the lack of fluency in English is the sole, is the, is the only factor in their difficulties when it comes to integrating into the wider world. I think that's perhaps worth mentioning. Yeah, Maybe that's, that's a good point. A... I, I, I had a very, 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 very hard time, personally. I had a very hard time, and I spoke English uh, fairly well. 
I don't know why people feel so much like this in particular is so important. People often ask me, so are there a lot more women than men who leave this community? And it took me a while to catch on that they assumed that women are equipped with the tools to enter the larger world easily and men aren't. As far as I know, the ratio of leaving is much higher for men or to some degree higher for men than it is for women. So I do think it is, for some for some reason, I don't understand, it gets stuck in people's minds as the issue that... Yeah. Um, I, think, that I think because it's something which is... It's something which is easy to point to. It's something which is quantifiable. You could just say a lack of... Well, there's two things. It's the scandal of being unable to speak English, having been sort of third generation American and being unable to speak English. And then again, it's something which is easy to explain and to just say, why am I struggling to integrate into society? It's because of a language barrier. And I think it's also perhaps, correct me if I'm wrong, I suspect that it's also something that people have to confront quite often. They say, oh, where's that accent from? That is or perhaps, but did, did I mispronounce that? Or did I... come? And I think this is something which they constantly sort of rub up against, which is sort of a constant source of embarrassment and a constant reminder of how the sort of the, 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 the ghost of your upbringing continues to haunt you. But I, 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 to come back to your question about child abuse, there is no way of answering the question without acknowledging that these are two completely different value systems. There is no way of pretending to say that, oh, we come from the same position of what the rights of the child is, but somehow we believe that because of the incredible um, skills of Talmud study, we simply don't need to teach English because we have got this completely superior um, curriculum. No, no, that's not what's happening here. There is a fundamental difference between how Western man sees the rights of a child, or individual autonomy in general, and how the Hasidic community sees um, what a, a child is and what the parents write over a child is. There is no question that the, the Hasidic community believes it is its duty, and obviously its right, to raise their children and deliberately, at the most formative stage of their life, to fully socialize them and give them the best possible chance of by default, identifying as Hasidim and remaining loyal members of the Hasidic community. There's absolutely no discussion about, oh, perhaps at the age of 18, we should allow them to send them on a gap year, let them discover the world and see, you know, do you still want to opt in or not? Yeah, some of them, I think the Amish, some of them do that. And there's the Bruderhof, which is another sort of Christian conservative group that do something like that. There is none of that. The Hasidic community would see it as the absolute, the, the biggest imaginal tragedy for um, a Hasidic parent would be its failure and its primary duty to raise children who are loyal to the Hasidic community. And that is the starting position. Now, how that is reconciled with how Western civilization sees the individual and the individual right, you know, that's, you know what, that's difficult. And, and, that's a difficult conversation to have, but there's no point pretending that Hasidim and mainstream society are on the same page when it comes to that question of individual autonomy. And if individualism is king in the way that certainly, you know, democratic man imagines it, then there's no question that the autonomy of the Hasidic individual is compromised by its upbringing. But at the same time, the Hasidic community can make a very convincing argument for anyone who wants to listen that democratic man is depriving the child of the elective responsibility and therefore the satisfaction that comes with family loyalty, with community loyalty, with being deeply rooted, with having a sense of a strong identity and purpose. And those are things which not very long ago even Western civilization, certainly before it was so secularized and when just Western civilization was much more religious, was also something that, that I think was widely accepted. But now with the erosion of religion in the wider world and with individualism, individual autonomy being the only thing that matters, I think it's very difficult to reconcile the Hasidic worldview with the individualism worldview. Can you explain... 
what Hasidic parents are doing. You actually write about that in some of your essays. Why do parents send their children to these schools? They're not just dumping them on a bus saying, get the kid out of my house. I'm a fanatic that doesn't want my child to be able to exit this society. And I, you know, I don't care about the school at all, as long as you don't, you know, you cripple the child from going out there into the world, which is what outsiders hear, I think. Right. There was something very different and deliberate and intentional happening for a Hasidic parent when they send their child to a Hasidic school. I think I think it's helpful to start with a basic assumption that I think we can all afford Hasidic parents. We could give them the benefit of the doubt that they love their children just as much as anyone else loves their children. We don't have to assume that they love anything else more than they love their own children. In the same way that decent human beings all over the world, from every civilization, from every society, have got this basic instinct to protect their children, to do what's best for them. Hasidic parents will choose, choose Hasidic schools because instinctively they know that they have set themselves an incredibly difficult task. They choose to settle in New York, in London, in global centers of modernity, which has the economic opportunities and advantages, but at the same time, to preserve a very distinctive way of life, which rejects a lot of the fundamental norms of mainstream Western civilization. And they recognize that the best way of ensuring that their children survive and thrive in the, under the conditions of modernity is to have a protective bubble of an education system, which is fully immersive, fully in sync with their own worldview and with their own values. And by sending their children at the age of three into this overwhelmingly thick cultural space, they have given themselves the best possible chance, very close to a guarantee that their children will emerge on the other end at the age of 18, by default, loyal to, satisfied by the Hasidic way of life. And this is something which people fail to acknowledge. Whatever the rates of um, defection or the rates of OTD. Yeah? No one has been able to put a number of, uh, on it. And uh, the numbers that I have seen are seemed completely um, laughable to me based on a anecdotal experience. But I don't think anyone can argue with the fact that the retention rates in the Pacific community are incredibly high. The rates of attrition are extremely low. No other Jewish community can compete with that. Not the modern Orthodox community, not the um, religious Zionist community in Israel, and uh, certainly not the reform and conservative um, movements. Uh, the explanation that perhaps the liberal press will give you, or some of the sort of detractors, hostile commentators of the Hasidic community will give you, say, yeah, well, of course, they're all trapped there. If only they were able to leave. If they could, they would leave, you know, there'll be no one left. <laughs> but because of how tightly controlled these people are by the sort of evil um, rabbinic figures sort of who pull the strings or have these incredibly powerful mechanisms of control, they can't leave. And which is why the people who do leave are put on a pedestal as this ex supremely brave and courageous people who have made this Herculean decision to, to somehow throw it all behind and escape, you know, the word escape, which you know, practically just means getting onto a bus. Right. And, and going back. But yeah. So I choose to explain that incredibly high retention rate. Primarily, if I have to choose a single factor, it would be the education system. Now, by the way, I, I just, you know, mocked the way that people describe the sort of tightly controlled um, um, system. There is a lot of truth to that, but actually, it is much more of a peer pressure and a social dynamic than something controlled by a handful of sort of village elders to, to pull the strings. It, it, of course, it is difficult to leave the, the facility community, but primarily that's because of how immersive and how overwhelming and how successful you like the socialization process is into the Hasidic way of life, that leaving is an incredibly difficult task. And I think what I always take issue with is the people who sort of argue that the Hasidic community you need to be less successful at raising your children to be Hasidic. This, this is almost what, you know, why are you doing such a good job? And I think that the natural instinct, I think, for parents is to raise children who follow in their footsteps. I think that's a natural 
tribal thing, do you think? Right. And who are successful in their world. Sorry? Who children who are successful in their world. We see this yes. universally. On their own terms. By their definitions of success. Now, the fact that you haven't accounted for the eventuality of your child deciding to reject that and then struggling is something it's incredibly sad and and i think anyone with empathy you know would feel bad for people who have decided to choose a different way of life and they're really struggling i think that's it's really painful to see but i can't accept i don't think it's reasonable to accept that the community needs to do more to undermine its own approach to raising children in their own way of life so that in the uh, in the case that they fail, that the child succeeds in an alternative way of life. Now, if you come from the point of view of, well, they have the individual rights and they should have the autonomy to have to be a complete blank canvas and decide what they want, then that's very difficult to understand. And of course, without going down the rabbit hole, that no education system is neutral. And this is the idea that a lot of secular people assume, that the liberal social organization of the last 40 years is the default form of human existence. And anyone um, who sprays for that is sort of inherently suspect, deviant somehow, when it's just, you're just a dominating way of life. And here's sort of a rather um, courageous and perhaps cheeky community that has decided, you know what, we'll show you, you know, we can, we can do it our way and succeed. But you know, if, if you look at it at a collective level, this is just two different forms of social organization and two different tribes doing it different ways. Yeah, it's very, very, very difficult for people to reconcile. I think people who come from a, a system of thinking where the individual needs to have the option to leave the city community, to reconcile it with those who the, the idea that you shouldn't have that option that the very education system is built on keeping the children in there's obviously i think this is very um a very simplistic way of putting it but people will say if you can't leave if you don't have the option of leaving then it's a cult you know that becomes the narrative and then um the view from the inside of successful children within this world become something that people cannot grasp. There is almost no concept of successful children within this world if these children don't have the option of leaving. Even though I think to some degree it's mutually exclusive, isn't it? Being able to raise successful children in this world depends on not preparing them for the outside. There's a combination of two things. It depends on providing them with some sort of ideological core, and it also depends on on, on building barriers between your own community and the wider world. The Hasidic community tends to do much more of the barriers. If your most important weapon to protect yourself from the overwhelming forces of modernity, which threatens to swallow you up, if that involves deliberately developing a culture, a counterculture, which is designed to reject the norm, then not being able to speak English might not not necessarily be a bug. It might be a feature. Why then why boys? Why only boys? Okay. This is something which I I I might get in trouble um for saying this and I can't claim that this is the correct answer. But it's just something that I was asked this in an interview um, a few months ago and it was just something off the top of my head which I have um Boys with, but I'm not claiming, uh, you know, I reserve the right to withdraw this. I, okay. <laughs> I think, again, all of this is instinctive. There isn't someone who's made this decision. But I think ultimately, boys are a bigger flight risk than girls. I think boys, much more effort has to be invested in keeping boys towing the line. And I, I'm aware that when I say this, this is the exact, all of the markers of a cult. This is, you know, towing. I'm sorry, I'm hoping that some of the listeners and a lot of them, I hope, are sort of, of the viewers, you know, are capable of understanding the nuances here. But I think that if, if you have to think carefully about who needs more investment 
and more safeguards to ensure that they remain loyal to the Hasidic community, I think you would worry about boys more than girls. Why do you think that is? Um, I don't know. Well, I've got some theories, but that's not, you know. I see. Okay, we're not speculating. Well, Let's go I, I back. don't know, but I think anecdotally, it, it makes sense to me. I hear that. I, I said that earlier that we see more men leaving, uh, I think. Um... There is another explanation, which I think uh, a historical explanation, which I think makes sense. Um, and that is that um, the boys' schools are a continuation of hundreds of years of a certain format of very traditional Jewish education of sending the child off to the local Malamud in his house. And the old Talmud Torah of the shtetl, which ultimately Talmud Torahs and yeshivas today are a continuation of that, whereas girls' schools only came about in the 19, late 1920s, 1930s by Sara Shira's movement in Poland. And that was in response to Orthodox Jewish girls, especially from um, wealthy families, going off to, uh, to Christian schools and to secular schools or to Zionist schools. So I think the way... Um, Hasidic or Orthodox Jewish girls' schools, what originally conceived was in response to this major problem of girls attending uh, secular schools. And I think it was set up to, they were set up to compete with those schools. You know, because they, obviously going from a time when, when, when Orthodox Jewish girls, up until sort of the Habsburg Empire, weren't attending schools at all. And it was only sort of in that sort of period when it became mandatory for girls to, well, Formal education for girls was introduced, and then it became mandatory, and the Orthodox community simply didn't have the infrastructure for it, and ended up sending their daughters to secular, to non-Jewish schools, and then suddenly there was a major issue with defection. There's a very well-documented, well there's a book by um, Rachel Manikin, I think, called Rebellion of the Daughters, where she describes this, where she uses sort of a few interesting case studies, but she has, you've got these sort of um, very poor Galician families which, whose daughters ended up being trafficked in the Argentinian sex trade. And then you have some well-off Krakow Polish families whose children ended up escaping to, to monasteries and converting to Christianity. That was a very real challenge in, in Eastern Europe. And in response, the, the modern-day Hasidic um, schools or Orthodox schools at the time, ultra-Orthodox schools came about. And I think it is possible you, I think you can argue that the Hasidic tradition of schooling can be traced back to that period when all you needed to do is have your own version of school so that your daughters don't go to the secular or the Zionist or the non-Jewish school. And that might also be an explanation, and it might be a bit of both. Uh, my my theory before I heard yours uh, about the boys being a flight risk has always been that there is a very long and strong tradition about the the fight for retaining a pure and different education for boys that even with COVID we saw, I had relatives say, it's fine if the girls are out of school, the boys, no matter what, they need to go to school. I think that had nothing to do with types of education had everything to do with a kind of Masita Snape, you know, putting yourself, you so, taking tremendous risk to keep this particular part of of the world alive, the boys sitting and studying and learning Torah. I think, I think it but goes think, very deep. But do you think it is about learning and studying Torah, or do you think it's about the risk of ex of exposure to bad influences? Probably the risk of exposure to bad influences has pushed for such an emphasis on keeping the boys sheltered. I right. think, yeah. But I think when you have so many years of a history of sacrificing. To keep the boys sheltered in a, in an education institution, it becomes a reflexive um, act of self-preservation. There seems to be a very strong reflexive need to keep the education system as it is, almost like everything depends on it, in a uh, way that other elements of the society have not resisted change. There's also a practical element. Uh, a mother of eight or nine children will tell you if you could, you know, say she's got six girls and three boys, if she could choose which ones to have at home. They'd rather have the girls at home than the boys. They're just yeah. boisterous, turn the house upside down, and which is why certainly in 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 Britain, the the school Canada, the boys have far fewer days off than the girls do. The girls don't have school on a Sunday here. The boys all do. They have I mean, summer vacation. vacation is very different here, but but the boys only get three weeks off in 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 Britain, and the girls get six weeks. So so it's you know very different in that sense. 
And I think, again, it could, it could be just practical. You know, sometimes what we find, we were looking for some elusive, complicated explanation. It could just come down to, to the very realities, the practicalities of child rearing and the challenges that mothers face at home and how some of those decisions are rooted in that. So I think that shouldn't be underestimated. That's what I think. I think what if the education system is completely uprooted? How will parents afford to send their children out of the house for so, so many days of the year, that costs a lot of money. That would put further strain on the entire system. A lot of people frame it from the perspective of if the children would be educated more, there would be more money. But if the children would be educated more, the, it would cost more money, right? There's perhaps yeah. resistance from there. Well, you know, one of the arguments, um, I think this would even appeared in the New York Times article, but it certainly comes up a lot to say that you know, they they come out of high school and they're not prepared for university. They're not able to join a university. And to, I find it hilarious because that's the point. I think if you want to improve standards of secular education in the Hasidic schools, you first have to convince parents that this will not leave, lead to going to university. You see, it, this is sort of held up that, you know, if you don't provide them... because. Often, if you try to break it down into specific, they say, okay, how much English are you demanding? And how much uh, numeracy do you think is necessary? And if it comes down to simply basic functional skills and the way that a new immigrant is supposed to learn in order to function in society, then it's actually fairly minimal. You don't need that much. But if you make an argument that they need, to, they need a certain level of attainment in English and maths in order to progress to higher education, that's when you make the argument, right, which is why you need to, you need the equivalency. This is where substantial equivalency, that sort of term which keeps coming up, this is why you need to offer an equivalent education so that they can go off to university. And I don't know why no one is mentioning this, but that is the biggest threat. Going off to university at the age of 18 or 19 will destroy everything, all of the efforts and all of the investment over the last 18 years that you've invested into your child. Now, it, it happens to be that I think things are changing. I think the distant learning programs and the way that people can pursue academic qualifications without having to live on a university campus is a game changer. And I think that actually, as it happens, Hasidim are adjusting to it. I think you are now seeing so many different programs and different initiatives, primarily for girls, but I think increasingly we will see in the, in, in the coming years academic qualifications for boys. And I think this is, again, some of this sort of ideological flexibility that I was talking about earlier. When I was growing up, we were, the explanation for not being allowed to pursue um, academic qualifications was some sort of um, enlightenment, anti-enlightenment arguments. We, we, you know, we have the strong tradition of against what was the, the old German word of Bildung. The old, uh, you know, you're not allowed to actually pursue higher education because it corrupts the mind and so on. And it's amazing because as soon as the cultural threat of the university campus is receding, you see this increase in alternative options of pursuing academic qualifications. Because it is, you know, a passport to employment, a way of, of, of you know, pursuing professions. I have in my own family, I, well, I myself, I'm finishing my master's degree now. I have two brothers who are lawyers. Um, um, one is doing a degree in psychology. You know, we are sort of this sort of family who, who is sort of really um, ambitious. It, ambitious, if you like. But none of us had to go and attend university campus, all doing sort of distant learning programs. And I think that as that becomes an option, there will be a new conversation about higher um, education. But at least in the, in the traditional sense of going off to university, that is that just means destroying all of the years of of socializing him and preparing the child into becoming, you know, this little person into becoming a future successful member of the Hasidic community. I think that if someone really wants to um, have this conversation about how Hasidic can pursue the high professions, then you need to recognize that and see how can we target, let's say, 25 year olds who are already married and anchored in the community and therefore far less of a flight risk and also a bit older and not as impulsive, you know, come up with alternative routes for people in that age group to pursue academic qualification. I think a lot of that is happening. It, it is happening in Israel. It is happening outside of it. But again, this is where 
it is no longer a threat. So many of the things that you'll be told at the age of 18 is absolutely unacceptable, out of the question. It goes against everything that we believe in. How come seven years later it's perfectly acceptable? How come listening to the radio at the age of 16 is a cardinal sin on pain of being kicked out of yeshiva, but being a 25-year-old who's just commuting to work, you can have the radio on in your car and no one bats an eyelid. Maybe if a super pious person comes into the car for a ride, he might ask you to turn it down a little bit. But, so what's going on there? Is this a, a, a something which is prohibited that you're not allowed to engage in or not? But again, all of this is just all to do with how do we successfully raise the next generation into future successful members of the facility community. And if any, if any of those activities are a threat, yes, we will retrospectively fit some sort of ideological, halachic prohibition, and it's fine. It, it, as long as the bottom line is, this is a threat, we have to resist it. When it's no longer a threat, we can make accommodations. Meaning, meaning once you're married, you're an adult, you're into your 20s, you're trusted to listen to the radio without it completely changing you, minors are very protected. That's essentially the decision. Oh, there's no question that the teenagers, adolescents, and even late teens, even early 20s, are much more impressionable. They are at the most formative stage of their lives. And which is why, you know, if you look at those think tanks and you look at all of those different cultural movements and foundations, the really smart ones are investing whatever agenda they're pursuing, whether it's LGBT advocacy or pro-Israel um, um, lobbying. The really smart ones are targeting elementary schools and middle schools, and that's where they're running programs. And high schools, because again, they recognize that this is where hearts and minds are won over. Not some 45 year olds who's bored in the evening and wants to come and listen, listen to a lecture. You know, they're, they've already, they are where they are. There's much, there's, there's far less sort of movement in that age group. It's the younger children who are up for grabs, if you like. I, I hate to do this, Ellie, but I'm going to come around to the cult thing again. I personally roll my eyes. I don't like the whole word cult. It, I think people throw it around as a word of judgment, and I think it reduces the conversation completely. And um, uh, personally, I don't think it's relevant to talk about the Hasidic community and the question of it having its own way of life in terms of cult language. But because I get this question all the time, I still want to ask you to try to articulate if you keep children sheltered and you don't want to give them the option to leave, why is this not a cult? I, I'm just putting the question out there for you to suffer through okay. it. I, if you insist on the definition of a cult being keeping socializing children in, into a particular way of life and doing everything you can to keep them loyal to that way of life, then I guess it meets the technical definition of a cult. What I reject is the connotations of the word cult and the images that it conjures up and people who start imagining some weird, um, some guru somewhere out in the sticks or somewhere in Utah in, in some compound who's got sort of thousands of innocent, vulnerable people that he's got in his sort of grip by the power of his charisma and hypnosis or something. And I think I would much rather think of it as a parallel universe. It has the full range of all the different temperaments from good people to bad people, different, you know, fraudsters to super nice and kind people. It has the full range of what humanity has to offer. Some really, really horrible characters and some really, really, truly special people. But I think where Hasidim have figured out something, which the Western world has got a lot to learn from, is how to organize socially. Which is, this isn't about superiority. This isn't about, who. Oh, this is just about a form of social existence, which I believe close to all Hasidim, um, especially in America, but by extension, all Hasidic communities, because they, you know, they follow the same sort of patterns, have been able to figure something out, which I think is something that we should, which is worth protecting. Now, if that therefore meets the technical definition of what the dominant society has decided as a cult, well, I'm sorry. I mean, is that, I'm not sure what you want me to do. Do you want me to change the definition of a cult or change the Hasidic community? I'm not, I'm, I'm not able to do either. I know what people think of when they hear the word cult. And I, as someone who has grown up in the Hasidic community and still is very committed to it, I don't recognize that at all. Yeah. 
Yeah. I have explained to you before earlier that there is a fundamental misunderstanding about individual autonomy. I think Hasidim don't subscribe to this idea that you have to raise blank canvases who can make form their own opinions about everything. They do genuinely believe that their way of life is fundamentally correct and therefore something that they should make every effort to uh, I'm, I'm so careful not to use certain trigger words because you you know you would use the word indoctrinate or brainwash you know that you start with all sorts of alarm bells go off but it is just a very proud tradition that I see them don't just see as some sort of bonus it would be nice you know we have an existence outside of that but you know in our family we also keep um halacha or we also um celebrate certain festivals but fundamentally we are um western american citizens no, they don't see it they see themselves as a people apart who follow a very particular way of life the barriers to entry into that community are very high and very difficult that this is not a missionary community that evangelizes and tries to subscribe other people this is a very this is a tribe with a lot of in-group solidarity occasionally sort of well mainly ambivalence about the west the rest of the world sometimes that spills over into being a little bit obnoxious on certain people and that should sometimes be reined in i think but i think some of it is natural sometimes you get you get into trouble for indulging too much but those are all I don't see it as something fundamentally deviant. Then again, they would say, well, I wouldn't, would I? Because I'm part of it. So No, what? no, I'm not I'm not part of it. I'm I'm satisfied with your answer. I think the term cult describes something else. Uh that's my personal feeling. I also I appreciate what you are are saying about its connotations are largely to say I think people should have a choice to leave, which comes from the individualistic mindset from the West. You're essentially applying your own values. That's that's what it is, right? Does that make yeah, sense? I think so. By the way, I still do think that people, that people should have a choice to leave. I think those people who engage in, in any sort of practical ways of preventing someone from leaving, intimidating someone or threatening someone, to the extent that that happens, I think that's wrong. I think I think there's nothing wrong with trying to persuade people to stay, and and in fact I think we can do a much better job of articulating why it's worth sticking around, and I would much rather see more of that, making a stronger case for teenagers who are a bit disillusioned to try and convince them why it's worth it. I don't think enough of that is happening, and I think to the point where blackmail or intimidation exists, I think is wrong. I don't accept that this is. That this happens everywhere and i think it largely comes down to individual cases and even more importantly i think it often is part of family dynamics as opposed to larger communal structures and again people fail to recognize that the fact that the family um, has managed to get the endorsement or the backing of an important rebbe or the funding from a community to pay for lawyers in order to fight to keep custody of the children you know all of those things are actually just, I, I think, the product of the incredibly strong support network of solidarity that exists within the Sassuri community, as opposed to this sort of super organized secret church that punishes dissent and people who have escaped. I think it's much more of the former, less of the latter, but they are individual stories. I've never believed in whitewashing those stories that have been shared publicly. I, you know, it pains me to see how those stories dominate the portrayal of the Sassuri world. And I think the, you know, the few stories that Netflix have decided to dramatize or the certain books that have made it big or the features in the magazines, they tend to dominate the narrative about the facilic world. And I think, I think YouTube, what you're doing and some of the others, but Peter Santanello, I think that's, that offers something new because it, it used to be a choice between either talking to the PR people, either going to speak to Rabbi Niederman in Williamsburg, and he was like the gatekeeper, and you would see this big hat and a good, decent, polished English, and he would show you, take you to the nicest um, local mother baby home, which has just been done up, and you know, a bit of lipstick here, a bit of window dressing there, and everyone was happy. And now those filters are gone because the YouTubers, the vloggers are gaining access to real people. Your interview with Pearl um, 
Peter Santomeno, who's done his series, which, you know, again, meeting real people. Uh, and I think that that would hopefully, you know, trigger a shift and people who want to understand the community better will be able to go to those sort of channels and find out for themselves. Are you, by the way, considered a maverick in the community or entirely outside of the box? I don't know. You know, one of the advantages of of the the lack of English proficiency in the Hasidic community is that I, I, is that I, I get away with a certain amount as long as it's written or spoken in English. I, see. I guess I've pushed some boundaries. I I I genuinely believe that I that I'm committed to the Hasidic community, and I don't think that I undermine its interests. And, you know, I get some pushback. I get people who are really uncomfortable with some of the things that I'm saying. It was like, you know, that's the quiet part. You're not meant to say that bit out now, occasionally. What you're doing is you're trying to understand the community rather than to give a spin that... Um, right? I, yeah, so, but I'm, I'm personally fascinated by it. I know this is sort of interesting because I live in it, but I just find it absolutely remarkable i think it's it's a shame i think just completely from a neutral perspective i think this is a phenomenal sociological um study to be to be had you know of all sorts of assumptions that are made about raising children about marriage about social organization about welfare about economics how is it so many different areas of public policy of sociology of of all sorts of areas of life which um, where where you've got so many, because this isn't in a in the Middle East or this isn't in rural, um, somewhere, some sort of far outback in Australia or somewhere, you know, this is in New York and in London, with people who are fully engaged with modernity. You know, unlike let's say the Amish, whose mechanism for maintaining the way of life involves physically, geographically distancing themselves from modernity. This is, you've got this Hasidic movement that have set up camp precisely within it, right in Brooklyn, New York, in, in London, you know, 10 minutes from the city, from the city center and thriving in this way. And in fact, by doing that, they were able to take advantage of certain tools and, and certain infrastructure, which has only helped them grow and thrive. I think, I think it's fascinating. And, and I wish people would just find it fascinating without just, without therefore, okay, how do we liberate these people from their terrible situation? Or how do we use them in some sort of pro-Trump, anti-democratic sort of agenda and not the sort of LGBT move? Whatever, you can, you can, I've got opinions on all of that, by the way, and everyone should, but that, that this is separate from that. Yeah. This is just remarkable on its own terms yeah well i am one person coming to the table i'm i'm interested i'm fascinated without judgment like i i i think it is like i share with you that interest by the way how long would you say that fascination goes back to when for me you, yeah I, I don't think there was a watershed moment i can't point to a specific um place and time there, there are various moments for me which have been very important moments to gain a deeper appreciation. Um, I think the development of social media was a big one. And the way, especially as an educator, what it's doing to teenagers. In the wider the world. world. In the wider world. I don't think people are talking about this enough, but you know, it's, mm. you look at some of the studies, the mental health crisis among teenagers, that the way it's entirely altered the way that young children, I'm, talking, I'm not talking about society as a whole, specifically young, impressionable, vulnerable children who are too young to drive, too young to drink, too young to smoke, but are old enough to have an iPhone with access to social media apps that have been designed deliberately to hack into the brains of teenagers, to exploit the reward pathways in the brain, to have this, and, and the way this has triggered this entire... What a real mental health epidemic, which is completely altered. I speak to, occasionally, I get to meet principals of, of non-Jewish schools at conferences and so on, and people who have been in the job for 20 years and will describe how it's completely changed. And I look at the Hasidic community, and at least so far, this is just not a problem that they have to contend with.
And Social you... media use for children doesn't exist. Of course, there are exceptions, fine. But as a general rule, as a father of four girls, I don't have to worry by default, and I hope it doesn't happen, that my children, by virtue of attending school, will come home demanding an iPhone and access to Instagram. It's just not something that I... Now, you can't predict when these innovations and developments will happen. The only way you can resist them is if you have the infrastructure built to be able to resist innovations until you have evaluated them properly. I think if mainstream society in 2007 would have known what the smartphone will become and what social media will become, I think without question, there would have been at the very least to say, well, this is not for people under the age of 18. But because... Maybe. But I think so. I think... I I mean, think people, people see it. I think it's not in doubt that it is extremely poisonous to children, but the culture is such that the idea of banning anything for children in the realm of technology is just, it's not there. Well, I don't think so. But the, well, in the realm of technology, exactly. The because technology, technology is the, w- one of those areas of innovation, which is developing faster than humans can evaluate them. Yeah. I think if you, people are perfectly happy to ban smoking to children and to ban driving to children and to ban alcohol from children. I don't think we, I, I don't think we have a problem banning things. In fact, I think the Western world is becoming increasingly more comfortable with banning things. If you ask, if you do a survey of mainstream parents, honestly, if you have a choice of whether your child should have access to social media or not, if you were given a simple choice without any to would you want your child to be on social? I'm talking specifically social media. I know how important Netflix is to parenting and to childcare, specifically social media. And by the way, even more specifically, girls. If you would have the choice to avoid all of the potential eating disorders, um, mental health crises, all sorts of the incredible peer pressure, the bullying, which used to be confined to school, at least when you came over at four o'clock, you could have a break from bullying. At least you could be in the comfort of your own home. But that doesn't exist anymore. Are you telling me that any parent, this is specifically parents who care about the children, wouldn't say, of course I don't want them to have anything to do with it. I'm convinced that most parents wouldn't want social media for their children. I I think social media is poison, so it wouldn't be hard to convince me. But I've spoken to a lot of people who have had a very different opinion about it, who think the children are well connected through uh, social media and it's an opportunity. I'm... All right, maybe I'm, it's me, I'm sold. Maybe I'm it's sold. me being uh, a, a member of a cult. I, I maybe think it's me being a member of a cult. <laughs> it could be. I just no, I, I, I appreciate think... where you're coming from. Go on. No, and therefore, I don't think I see them. I've got to had some sort of particular insight, knowing in advance of oh, social media that's going to be the real poison, and therefore we're going to opt out of that. No, they come from this in- instinctive suspicion of anything new. Back in the noughties. 2005 to 2010, Hasidim had were waging war against the internet. People were laughing at it with these major rallies, packing out stadiums, and all everyone was talking about was the internet. Now, that was supposed to be, back then, you know, the biggest, this was like, we're introducing, we're adding a new major prohibition. This is like, you know, the Catholic Church, where they said it, said it publishes some sort of new sin, was, and this is the internet. And then, slowly but surely, I see them figured out how to exist with the internet. We're still figuring it out. Slowly. So, okay, you can have internet in the office. There's no real reason to have it at home. There's perhaps certain filtering devices that you'll need to have. And, you know, they're struggling with it. This is the ongoing struggle. And whether it will be resolved definitively or not, both time will tell. But there's one thing which has emerged, which pretty much there is a consensus across the board. Whatever the virtue of the internet is, it has nothing to do with children. And we can all agree that we can keep the children off the internet. Now, there is an argument where some parents say, okay, well, I can control my computer at home, and therefore I don't need you to tell me whether I should have the internet at home. I can choose to have it, and I can occasionally choose to let my child go and order something on Amazon. These are sort of smaller arguments, the details. But at a, at a broader level, the has I see them by virtue of being of having this ability to resist changes until they're able to evaluate them. I think has allowed them to opt out of social media for teenagers. I th- it might sound like a trivial example. I think it's huge. I think it's massive. I think massive. Of course, it's massive. 
Well, well, exactly. And I think that, and again, for people to think that Sweden will sort of have this sort of foresight to be able to predict, no, they don't. They just have, I think, a very healthy suspicion of anything new until they figure out what the hell it is. Yeah. In contrast to you have to get with the times, you have to be open to change, go with change. There is a let's wait to see how it works. And, and well, but also, but also in contrast to whereas Hasidic parents have got, they're not expected to have to figure this all out for themselves. That is way too much to ask from individual parents. Why shouldn't, you know, individual parents have to all become experts on, on child psychology and experts on pedagogy and you're not expected to become experts. You rely on communal infrastructure to figure that out for you. Now, that is the contract that parents who send their children to schools. I mean, they are parents who are into homeschooling and do want to take much more control over that. But most parents in the modern world have opted for a system where they delegate the responsibility for raising children to some extent to wider society, to the community, if you like. Parents who have their children come home, an 11 year old daughter and say, mom, I want to get an iPhone because my whole class has one. That is part of that process of the community having made a decision that this is acceptable. This mother has no way that she's actually gone through the literature and made a careful decision whether this is good or bad. She just went on mom's net on a, on, on a forum and to say, well, what are we saying? Are we going for it? Yeah, we're in. Okay, you can have one, darling. But this is, you know, we can mock this, but this was always part of the contract. The contract is that you belong to a community, you send your children to a school system, and you delegate some of the decision-making responsibility to society. I think Hasidic parents still are able, I think, to put a lot of trust in the society that they delegate that responsibility to. Mainstream parents, increasingly, you have these movements of homeschool your children, because that trust has been broken, I think. Yeah, it speaks also to the fact that ultimately this lofty idea of choice that parents should have a choice and should be able to raise their children any way they want. It is much more an idea, an ideal than it is yeah. a reality. Because uh, I, as a public uh, school uh, parent, am in a system well, in which social media is, it's not optional. It's phones and being a part of that milieu, it's not an option. I'm conscious of the fact that I've come across now as some sort of Hasidic supremacist and and this isn't my thing. I don't go out. Uh, this is part of defending the Hasidic community and just explaining how by by having this unique approach to child rearing, it has some massive advantages. I'm not here making an evaluation of the, the system overall and saying which one is better or which one is worse. I, I've never tried to do that, and I don't think for a moment that if I would be a part of mainstream society that I would consider joining the Hasidic community. Mm -hmm. uh, that's not what I was suggesting. Right. But I think, I think people should be able to see alternative value systems and ways of life and see that sometimes it is more than just a brainwashed, indoctrinated cult who are waiting for you to come and liberate them. Yeah, of course, of course, of course. It, it is a robust society with a, its own, of course, it, He's texted me. He's, he's. Don't worry about it. It's Lyle okay. It's Thursday night. We're, we're we're fine. It's Thursday night. What is Thursday night? Let's tell the viewers what Thursday night is. Well, Thursday night it just seems to be sort of the beginning of the weekend, and this is where you can you can start. You know, the routine starts to loosen up a bit. There you go. You're no longer even if you've got work Friday morning, but it's only going to be a half day. And you know, you're going to be able to catch up on sleep, catch up with family and so on and therefore you can indulge in sort of more socializing sticking around in shore for a bit longer a bit of chillers and kugel and you know just hanging out a bit more okay let's hang out a bit more and and wrap this up by talking about a much more serious part of the civic education which is also something that's being discussed a lot now is corporal punishment i see it as and as someone who's in education um i see it as as a, a legacy from a a, a previous generation I find um, that newer schools, so schools that have been set up more recently, either because it was a new Hasidic sect after a breakup in, in a Hasidic sect, so therefore the school is up new, or any schools like, for example, my school, which was set up 10 years ago, don't tolerate it at all because they employ 
new members of staff and to make it clear this is not how we do things. Over punishment isn't an option. Um, it's illegal and could get the school into trouble. It is also the consensus is that this is not the best way of of disciplining children, of correcting their behavior. But I think in some of the older schools, especially some of them who have teachers who've been there for many, many years, I think it still exists. And it's mainly, I think what has changed is that parents don't really put up with it anymore. I think when I was growing up, um, it was much more common and it was tolerated by parents. Parents accepted it. And I think nowadays, from the few examples that I'm aware of, when a child gets hit in school, there's usually a big backlash from the parents. Parents will be on the phone to the head teacher, to the principal, they'll make a big fuss about it. And therefore, it is receding into, it's not extinct yet. Yeah. But, I, but, but I think it's close. So I think it does exist. But I, I, I see it as something which exists as a sort of a legacy from a previous generation, which is being phased out as what is the end of being phased out that's my experience i suspect that there's certain sects within the community that have a higher tolerance for it and perhaps even sort of the more hardcore um more extreme elements small pockets of the community perhaps it's more pre prevalent there i don't have any first-hand experience i don't know do you think do you think in a conjunction with it receding in schools it's also receding in homes um, I don't know. You don't know. Uh, I'm Is not there sure. A conversation about not the whole doing the whole spare the rod, spoil the child. It's certainly not. I think it was when I was growing up, not that long ago. I'm in my early thirties. I felt like it was much more common. I think being, you know, slapped by your parents, by your father, was seen as the expected consequence for sort of misbehaving, for fighting with your siblings or well for not listening to your mother or something like that. I have to be careful there because I, I don't know how I obviously speak with and engage with hundreds of parents in my capacity as a, as a principal and in, you know, working in various schools, I simply don't see it. I don't confront it. I don't see, I, I think that culture has changed. But it's very difficult to quantify it, to say, you know, is it being eliminated? Is it, does it still exist, but it's less frequent? Um, I don't know. There's certainly more and more people who, who consider it beyond the pale, raising your hand on a child. I think the more people, and they don't, it's just, I think it's just sort of a different world where understanding the emotions of a child, the sensitivities of a child. I think there's been a, a revolution of the civic community, just generally about sort of, addressing emotional needs of children, the, you know, therapy being offered for all sorts of different anxieties. And I think all of that is new. And I think that goes hand in hand with, you know, rolling back of what were the sort of the more traditional ways of disciplining children. But, but I don't think, Frida, I don't think this is much different to, to the rest of society. I think it's just sort of going to maybe a generation behind. Right. I, th I think it's just it's just catching up with wider trends. It's, it's, that's how I always saw it. What do you think the future of the debate is going to be of education? How do you see a solution? If you think we need one, to I say honestly, education? I don't know. I I, I think it, it can go off in different directions. I think, um, especially in New York, where it is clearly becoming a political issue where there are people who want to appeal to the Hasidic community and the way they responded to the New York Times article just shows that there's no real engagement with the issue. The very superficial, oh, anti-Semitic New York Times bashing, attacking Orthodox Jews and, you know, responsible for the spike in violence against Orthodox Jews. But again, this is not actually discussing the issue. And perhaps... That might also trigger, although it's perhaps difficult to foresee, but it might trigger sort of the the opposite side, the sort of the activist, anti-Hasidic movement. I think there will be a lot more of that. And I think because more and more Hasidim align themselves with the right politically in America. And what do you I think, mean by activist, anti-Hasidic movement? I don't get it. I think sort of pro-individualism, people who will start seeing the Hasidic community as another one of their targets, as a way of 
smashing the patriarchy, breaking down stereotypes, the gender wars, the identity politics. I think Hasidim will, as people discover more and more about them, and as Hasidim become more and more confident about their position, and I'm specifically not concerned, but I'm sort of interested in this sort of new dynamic of Hasidim identifying as part of, um, they see themselves no longer as outsiders, but actually as part of the sort of right-wing cultural rights in America. I think that might actually make them fair game. I think Hasidim benefited for many years of sort of turning a blind eye policy, but mainly because they didn't get involved. I think there was an understanding that we don't interfere with your politics and you don't, shouldn't interfere with our politics. I think Hasidim are changing that. I don't know whether it's the WhatsApp influence or the Ami magazine influence or just the natural, it comes with reaching a certain size and a certain level of confidence. And another new generation that has no longer got the anxiety that the parents had about the Goyim, you know, they feel much more um, emboldened. Whatever it is, it could, it could be various different reasons. But I've detected sort of this way of, you know, Ron DeSantis becoming a sort of a cult figure within the Hasidic community. And the way that Hasidim in the past had a very different, they used to sort of say Bill Clinton had, has got streets named after him in New Square. There used to be this sort of very deferential relationship with people in high office. Yeah, and it was very transactional, and now you've got this, you know, the gubernatorial case in New York is an example of that. Ideological, but also tribal, also seeing sort of an, an affinity and affiliation with various political groups in America. I think those trends are likely to have a big influence on this whole education debate because they might allow certain opponents of the Hasidic education system to actually be much more forthcoming in their attack on Hasidim. In a way that actually, up until recently, they would shy away from it. What do you want for this innocent community, which, you know, never harmed you, they don't leave them alone. And that suddenly becomes, as soon as you see, you know, people at Trump rallies wearing, you know, with long pious, and I think that, I think, puts them into the spotlight in a way that will make them more open to those attacks. So... It's difficult to tell. And, and then you'll have, I think you've got, for example, a growing Hasidic community in Florida, for example. And potentially, these are sort of very early stages of these new settlements, new satellite communities in red states in America. And it will be interesting to see how a community which was almost exclusively concentrated in Blue, New York, is suddenly branching out into red states, figuring out new ideas about religious freedom and about rights. And language that Hasidim were not really comfortable with up until very long ago. But it was all about to sort of, you know, may God save the Tsar and keep them far away from us. And that is sort of changing. So I, I think it's, it's interesting. I think we're, we're at the beginning of some very interesting times. I'm not, I don't think we can make predictions. I think things are changing fast and, you know, I would get the popcorn and watch. Well, now I'm letting you go for real. I feel like we're just getting started and schmoozing. Thank good you luck. so much. Have a good night. All the best. Keep well. Bye.